impact data integration. Now, I think there's been a little mix up between me not seeing the latest schedule and so the order of things may have changed a little bit. Um, I hope it's not too confusing. But this uh, next set of slides is all about the data, how we can get it, where we can get it from, and ultimately impact-based forecasting is all about the data. Uh, just about everyone in the room is involved in the forecast of the hazard. Being able to have access to the data, whether you have it or your emergency management has it or someone else has it, and being able to overlay the hazard on that exposure and vulnerability data is what ultimately allows us to have a go at forecasting the impact. So let's have a look at some of the data sources, how to get it, and some of the challenges. And to do it, I, I thought I'd use the WMO guidelines as an example, or, or as a lead through. Um, chapter four, recommended elements in the development of impact forecasts and warning services. 4.1, partnerships. So to get the data access, we'll have a bit of a look at that. Development of information and services. So what different types of data sources are there? I spoke a bit about the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, forgive me if I start saying ABS, if you hear that, that's what I'm talking about. Insurance, health, emergency services, damage assessment, I'll have a look at some of those data sources uh, and realistically this is my experience in Australia. So it'll be interesting to see how it compares uh, with your experiences. Functional requirements for impact based forecasts, warnings, uh, data and metadata management including acquisition, harmonisation, uh, harmonisation, interoperability and sharing strategies just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Should be easy. I'll talk about what we're doing in Australia in that space. Developing the capacity of National Met and Hydrological Services. Well, that's what we're doing here today and this whole week. And validation, the first couple of presentations, we talked a lot about how on the Extreme Weather Desk we're gathering data to verify and, and provide uh, reliability information. Let's start with partnerships. This is the Bureau of Meteorology's website. We have a section uh, devoted to business solutions. I work in national forecast services. We have data and digital, like an IT section as well. And so, but just the very fact that we recently restructured for a business solutions silo is interesting in itself. When, you, when I hear the uh, um, conversations and presentations from yesterday and how much it's all about developing relationships with our partners and our customers and our clients, that's where our future is in meteorology in so many ways. It's where a lot of our resourcing might come from. And uh, developing partnerships is a lead into that. The good thing about a partnership is whoever you partner with a lot of the time they've got data, really useful data, and the data that we need to make impact-based forecast services. So Bureau of Meteorology has very close relationships with our emergency management. That's not very unique. Every one of you do as well. I've heard that, you've told me, and uh, it would be a worry if there was any issues in that relationship. Uh, the Crisis Coordination Centre I talked about, the Australian Government, State and Territory Emergency Services, SES, State Fire Agencies, National and State Park Agencies. They have a huge amount of emergency management responsibility, particularly with fire, but also flood and, uh, and various other hazards. And then, of course, we've got our health agencies and Vic Health. What I've got here, this is Melbourne. Um, instantly recognisable for anyone who's been there. And uh, this was after a June 2014 event and that's the requests for assistance. So anyone who rang the SES and asked for help, whether or not they needed it or got it, this is plotted. Pretty useful data, gives you a bit of a feel for what the impact might have been. And so RFAs, requests for assistance, is 
data that we're not getting into our systems in real time. It's available real time. We've talked about it for at least a decade and it's still not happening. Hopefully it will. The usefulness of it is, doesn't, can't be overstated. Close relationships with energy. So you can imagine what happened after a whole state lost its power. The government got voted out. So there's a pretty high level of interest from the government in making sure the lights stay on. As such, we're developing relationships with our energy sector. I'll talk more about that in a second. Insurance. There's huge amount uh, of... Uh, talking to Joanne a lot about this yesterday, there's huge amounts of information that we can get out of the insurance industry from the exposure and vulnerability data that they collect. And there's certain people in the insurance industry who understand how much money they can make if our warnings are good and they're able to mitigate and warn people and people take action ahead of events. It's a perfect partnership if we can make it work. Oil and gas, this is the uh, gas pipelines around Australia. It gives a pretty good indication of where the gas lines are exposed, if there was a hazard. Uh, agriculture, we're experiencing a huge drought in New South Wales uh, over the last 18 months or so. And that's having a massive impact in that region, both uh, socially and economically. Uh, the, the impact on mental health is uh, become, we're becoming much more aware of in an analogous way to how I think uh, a lot of us became aware of fatalities around heat health uh, in the last decade or so. Other agencies, Geoscience Australia, are doing some fantastic things that I'll present a fair bit of that in a second too. Now, I won't read all of this, but the Australian energy market operator, they run and manage the Australian energy grid. And there were things that happened in that South Australian event that shouldn't have happened behind the scenes. So there's things, the lessons learnt there that have already been implemented. The, that forecast, that tornado forecast that we did 24 to 36 hours ahead of the event, they didn't know about it. And that's understandable, it's a development product. But now they know that there's a lot of expertise in our organisation, particularly a lot of the stuff that we're doing on the Extreme Weather Desk, that can help them uh, manage the, the grid and ensure the lights stay on. This is a partnership that's only been signed in the last uh, month, I think, and it's about eight pages long. But the main words are together, building resilience to future weather and climate impacts. The agreement establishes a strategic collaborative framework within which both parties are able to leverage their respective capabilities. There's already uh, various work packages that have sprung out of this partnership and quite a lot of money uh, being invested to make sure what happened in South Australia doesn't happen again. I thought it might be useful to, to put up a, an indication of the words in the signed document with the CEOs of AEMO and the Bureau of Meteorology um, for you and, the way, uh, for, uh, and how you might develop uh, more official partnerships. OK, let's have a think about insurance. We just talked about requests for assistance and how useful that information is for impact forecasting and also um, post-event review management. You can imagine once you, uh, an event goes through, if you had spatial indication of where people rank for assistance, uh, that's really useful information. This guy here, Bruce Buckley, I just spoke about some people who understand how the insurance industry can make money. He's one of them. The reason is he worked for the Bureau of Meteorology for about 35 years before retiring and now he works for Insurance Australia Group. And so we're good mates.
<laughs> and, and he uh, can't give us a lot of the data that he'd like to give us. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The main point I want to make is here. This image shows the claims data from a published document that Bruce put out with um, some of his colleagues. The claims data around Perth following a huge, uh, uh, very large, maybe giant hail, five to ten centimetre hail event in Perth. Uh, six centimetre hail smashing windows at the university. And you can see over here, the insurance industry love to describe these things as catastrophes. And uh, compared to previous claims data, this one really stands out for Perth. These black dots, the claims, something like 10 times more claims data comes in, the request for assistance. Something like that. We don't know for sure, but talking to Bruce, he says that what tends to happen is during an event, people ring their insurance company when something goes wrong first. And then they generally get told if they really need assistance, ring the SES, ring the State Emergency Service. So most people, so there's potentially 10 times more impact data coming into the insurance industry during an event in real time than what there is to the emergency services. I'm really interested in that data. They collect their own exposure and vulnerability data. Bruce told me about how they drive around in uh, you know, black cars that look like your Google Earth cars with LIDARs in them, and they go and use the LIDAR to figure out what the elevation of the front doorstep is in areas where they know it's exposed. They keep it to themselves, though, but it, why do they do it? They do it so they know about who's exposed, they can set premiums appropriately and they can try and get warnings out for, and hopefully people take mitigation if there's a hazard coming. So their exposure and vulnerability data is extensive, but it's commercially valuable. I've already said that one. Uh, the much to be gained in the mitigation space. So think about the probability of hail that we were talking about earlier on. Bruce is of the opinion that with products like that in real time, so we're on the extreme weather desk in October, we'll be running a test bed for the, our spring in November where we'll be testing those products uh, for the next three hours, not just the next day or two days and running um, and producing those for the next three hours continuously. If that percentage chance of impact of hail was available to the insurance industry and once it got greater than a certain threshold, like 10%, they could start sending SMS to all their Uber drivers saying, don't go into this area because there's large hail, potentially saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars in insurance claims. <coughs> so mitigation by those parts of the insurance industry that understand potentially makes them lots of money. Commercial value I've already mentioned, it's understandable. It would cost them a lot of money to go and get that exposure and vulnerability data. Can uh, the, the decision to spend that money is obviously an economic decision, so they know that they can make money by getting that data. The challenge from my point of view with um, uh, having good people embedded in uh, organisations like Insurance Australia Group is whether or not the people who are uh, able to make the decision to release such data whether or not we're able to convince them that there is economic benefit for their company by producing really good warning services to the community. That's the challenge. The other challenge is confidentiality. So when claims data comes in, uh, of course, they can't tell us 
exactly who's made a claim. There's a privacy agreement there. That's fine. Take a decimal point or two off the latitude and longitude that's recorded in the database, and then we might only know where the claim is within 100 metres or even within a kilometre. Still useful. I see that one as being easier to get around, but still a challenge. Australian Bureau of Statistics do a census about every four or five years in Australia. They are, in that census, they ask heaps of questions. I think the last time I went through and filled one out it took me about two hours, about seven pages worth of questionnaire. The vast majority of people don't do it, uh, but a lot of people do. And the information that is collected during that census is able to be used to produce social economic indexes for areas. So we call it CIFA, or the ABS call it CIFA. And using that information, we can broadly describe over an area what people's level of advantage or disadvantage is. CIFA produce an index of disadvantage. They produce an index of advantage and disadvantage economic resources, they ask you how much money you make. Lots of people won't fill that in, but enough do. Education and occupation, so how well educated is your area versus other areas? So using what you filled out in terms of your diploma qualifications, whether or not you're employed as a professional, high income, uh, whether or not you've got spare rooms in your house, compared with whether or not you're employed, what, if your income is less than about $21,000, I believe, overcrowding, one parent families, generally disadvantaged. So here is the variable list for the index of disadvantage. And things like English poor for Australia is a disadvantage and um, overcrowding, uh, disability, one parent, unemployed, um, child jobless, percentage of families with children under 15 years of age who live with parents who haven't got a job. So by taking all that information, they can produce uh, broad areas and, and uh, exposure information that we can use. Why is disadvantage data useful for impact forecasting? Let's us know about the vulnerability. And vulnerability is limits whether or not people can prepare. If you've got a tropical cyclone coming and you've got an income that it lets you go to the hardware and buy a pack of plywood and screw it to your windows, versus if you haven't got the income to do that, then there's two levels of outcome. And then in the recovery phase, if you've got income, you're in a very different situation to if you haven't. Okay, that's what the product looks like. And this is uh, the socioeconomic index for a disadvantage. And straight away, you can see there's data gaps. So I won't go around asking questions now, but I'd be very surprised if there's anyone in the audience who's had a go at collecting impact data that hasn't found gaps. Um, we don't, where we've got low population density, there's not enough statistical information to make a reliable index, so we don't. Uh, you can see in the heavily rural areas, you're a lot more disadvantaged than if you live in one of the capital cities. But some of the rural areas that actually get rainfall every now and then, don't do too bad. Pretty interesting website to go through and click around. And anyone can. If you go to the Australian uh, Bureau of Statistics and go looking for CIFA, click around. There's a really nice interactive website. Next, let's talk about some of the issues that a colleague of mine, Tony Bannister, has had with getting impact data to develop a thunderstorm asthma service. And in the interest of being interactive, hands up, who's heard of thunderstorm asthma? 
One person? Yep. I thought that'd be thought that'd be about right. It's not surprising. It's not a worldwide phenomena, but it's something that smashed Melbourne very recently. Here's all the events that we know about around the world, and the numbers are the amount of people that presented to hospital, hospital attendances, with asthma due to pollen. The people who uh, have hay fever and asthma are particularly exposed to thunderstorm asthma. If there's a lot of pollen, because you've had a good spring and a lot of grass has grown, then um, thunderstorm asthma, we think, is more of a risk. We're still learning. We've got to learn. We had around 10 fatalities, and that afternoon, evening, the Melbourne hospital system was extremely stressed. The chief officer turned on his computer and saw what was happening and turned it off. He thought there was something wrong with his computer, it had glitched. He did a restart, turned it on again, and then went into, the, uh, into action. Okay, so here's the event. Uh, we'll go through it quite quickly. And basically, uh, northerly flow coming in ahead of a convergent line. We had a, a line of thunderstorms that actually dissipated. But what we think is the convergent line increased the concentration of pollen. We're not sure what happens with the pollen in these situations. There's something about the pollen that gets broken up a lot smaller to tiny microfiber uh, microfibers that can get deep into the lungs, which normally your lungs would filter out most of the pollen. Still learning about it. We know we need to develop something because of the impact that this event had and there's been other impacts around the world. So how do you develop a service to warn people of the potential impact of thunderstorm asthma? You need data. So you can go back and look at all the past events and so what are the sort of data that Tony's been able to get? Hospital presentation data, that's going to be pretty useful. But it only comes in 24-hour totals. So the temporal resolution of the data is quite low. We've got it back to 1999. It's not too bad, 20-odd years nearly. What about the pollen? The technology for collecting information about pollen only gives us 24-hour totals from 4pm to 4pm goes back a little bit further, back to 1991, but it doesn't, it's not even going to match with a lot of the 24-hour hospital attendances, the information that we might get. ESTA. So in Australia, if you've got an emergency, you can pick up your phone and dial triple zero. I'm not sure what you dial in Argentina or your respective countries. I think it's 999 in the States. Is that right? Look at that. 911, there you go. And uh, I better remember that next time I'm there. And um, when people uh, make those calls, it's recorded and they've got a database. And we're just starting to uh, get a feed of that information. We haven't got it yet, but it's likely to be really useful. But whether or not it actually says why people call, um, we know it needs to be de-identified. I talked about taking it, dropping a couple of decimal points off the latitude and longitude information recorded with this. That's what will likely happen. But uh, not sure. So it's still accurate to the nearest kilometre and the nearest minute. Whether or not it will record that it's an asthma-related emergency, I'm not sure about yet. Uh, chemists. Lots of people don't ring anyone. They just go to the chemist in this situation, but there's no data about that. And the same with your doctor, general practitioners, they're called in Australia, GPs, and there's no data for asthma presentations there either. So 4,000 people went to hospital emergency departments. Doctors, uh, GPs around Melbourne were also inundated, but we don't have that data and we don't have past data on it. So there's a challenge there. Oh. Another risk matrix, uh, not unlike what we see in the WMO guidelines, UK Met Office, National Hazard Outlook, and uh, we, they, they, we did implement a trial service last summer, the idea being looking at what the district pollen count is and seeing whether or not you've got a likelihood of some kind of convergence. 
and then going for a low, moderate or high risk of thunderstorm asthma with that. It was felt that we needed to try something, even though we're still learning so much about it. Really interesting, though, because we, we, you need to learn the physiology of it and the meteorology and uh, um, you know, pull all that data together. OK. Harold Richter is heading up a project in the Bureau of Meteorology called Impact Based Forecasting. What they're looking at is forecasting the impacts of severe weather, modelling impacts. So what I presented earlier with the National Hazard Outlook, we're not modelling the impact. You've all picked up already that we're using a subjective process to quantify the impact in the National Hazard Outlook. To move to the step of modelling impact, you need the data, but you also need to know the relationships between the vulnerability and the hazard. So, objective, develop a pilot capability that will make useful predictions of community impacts of extreme wind and rain with the goal of improving timely mitigating actions by a range of stakeholders. Uh, a few photos, TC Yasi, Category 5, hit a high population dense area, 2011 floods during La Nina, which is heavy rain for us in Australia. Uh, we've talked about this event already, TC Larry. So these are the sorts of things that um, we'd like to be able to use impact modelling to uh, produce better information. Now, I won't go through these slides that I got from Harold. I won't go through the lot, but um, basically the, they, they take uh, guidance. So there's no, you will note there's no weather forecaster involved here. It's the first thing I picked up on when I asked Harold about it. Where's, where's the forecaster? No, this is all automated, hopefully. You take the exposure and vulnerability data, so building locations and attributes, uh, vulnerability relationships, put all that into a big black box and, or blue box in this case, and produce automated hazard and impact model converter, give you impact forecasts and, uh, and, and display it for the weather forecasters. What we're going to look at is this bit, the vulnerability relationships derived from the, some damage surveys. Okay, on the left here we've got the repair cost. So if a building is completely demolished, then your repair cost is 100%. If it's only slightly demolished, then it might only be 20%. On the bottom, we've got wind gusts in metres per second. And the various curves are dependent on different building codes over different years. So uh, the text down the bottom says a TC Tracy peak gust of 70 metres per second. TC Tracy, we talked about that before. It was the 1974 tropical cyclone that devastated Darwin. 250 kilometres per hour, 70 metres per second. A, ha a house built post-1980, the blue line, would be around 25% damaged. But a pre-1974 house, brown line, close to destroyed. So you think with relationship like this, if you had the building stock data and you had a good forecast of the, uh, of the winds and it was reliable, then you could nearly go to each house and say well, you're going to survive, you're going to get destroyed, you're going to survive, etc. and go down to that sort of scale. That's the aim. Unfortunately, in this project, at Harold and his team got a whole heap of data from the Emergency Information Coordination Unit. So they're uh, part of one of the New South Wales uh, emergency services who go around and do damage survey information. And they rate their damage as none, minor, major, severe and destroyed. And Harold uh, managed to get his hands on that data for a, an event in, in Dungog, which is the New South Wales coast. It was a rain event and there's some amazing imagery of a house floating down the street. Um, but what you'll notice is where you've got no damage, 
you've got wind speeds right up to 25 metres per second, and where you've got destroyed, you've got wind speeds that are only around 5 or 10 metres per second. We're not seeing a relationship that has increasing wind more destroyed. Why is that? Because most of the damage happened by the trees that fell on the houses, not by the wind. So it was a heavy rain event. And the theory being soils are looser, don't need as much wind, lots of trees around houses. And tree falls on house, house destroyed, but the wind strength's not that strong. So how do you derive a vulnerability relationship out of that set of data, particularly if the data doesn't have the information that the reason why the house was destroyed was because the tree fell on it, not because of the wind. That has been identified in a secondary set of data that uh, was collected for this particular event called the SES Beacon Data, so it was another emergency service. And uh, part of the outcomes of this project so far is to make sure that the way that this post-event damage assessment is done allows for recording of things like the tree fell on the house, not the wind on the house. So we can go back and attempt to develop those sort of relationships. Now, Nexus, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. A National Exposure Information System. So if you've got uh, good information about the building stock, then theoretically you'll be able to uh, do the sorts of things we've been talking about once you've solved that vulnerability relationship. But there's also other sources of data. So during this project, we got data of building stock from the Nexus system, which is developed by Geoscience Australia. It's a, um, a uh, you know, government agency, highly trusted. And then we got data from, um, from a local survey. And you would hope that the types of data, uh, so houses with different kinds of um, building types, like things like specific combination of wall materials, and so there's 10 categories and roof materials, you would hope that the Nexus data would match the building stock data along this line but it doesn't. So which set of data do you trust? Do you trust Geoscience Australia or do you trust the building survey or do you trust none of it? Because it doesn't match. Impact forecast. So once you figure out, got that sorted and you've got the vulnerability relationship and you've got the, uh, the trusted data, you can do a forecast. And this is the sort of scale where um, uh, Unfortunately, I haven't got a, a, a length scale on it, but it's probably, from top to bottom, might be five kilometres. So you can nearly make out how if you did take a model and a vulnerability relationship and have data, so even though we can't trust all this data, part of the project is that they still went through this process, then you can spit out whether or not uh, you think that green areas unlikely to be damaged, brown areas, severe damage, possible, on the assumption the forecast comes off, or even destroyed. So you can imagine that these would be the ridge lines where houses are exposed. So that's the goal. That's the end goal. Quite a few problems to solve in the meantime. OK. How much time are we going to go for? 15 minutes, thank you. Okay, so back to ABS, uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics. Generally share impact observations. We're up to 4.3 now, functional requirements of impact-based forecasts and warnings. So generally share impact observations, need the ability to integrate, categorise, and manage third-party observations, establish agreed data formats and data st standards, develop the principles through which data can be exchanged and shared, Craft systems that can work together, 
breached joint agreements to manage foreground and background intellectual property rights. So that's to do with the information that you had yourself before you developed a partnership with someone versus the information that you developed together in the partnership. And who has the, how does the intellectual property rights of both those sets of information uh, going forward? I've got to say that CAP and the presentations I've seen from Elliot over the last couple of days does a lot in this space in terms of bringing together an international standard that so many people are picking up on. Except Australia that decided to modify it slightly, but anyway. So what is Australia doing in the data integration space? The good news is we had a government I say had, because it was likely to do with our Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister Malcolm Turbull, who uh, recently was um, pushed aside. But he understood the importance and the value of data and data integration. And so we have a project run by the Australian Government that's well funded, 130 million Australian dollars. <laughs> Straight off their website, what are the aims? bring in Commonwealth agencies and contribute data, policy, skill, provide technical expertise. Combine public data as authorised by law, provide access to authorised users in specific research units, provide a secure environment for analysis, manage the safe and secure storage of data, expand existing Commonwealth data integration projects to include new data. So that's promising. So there is some money and there is the will to work in this space. What else is happening? Russell Hay, he's with Geoscience Australia and he developed the Nexus system. Nexus, National Exposure Information System. These slides are Russell's. And among other things, it has building stock. We just looked at a particular example where the building stock didn't manage some other building stock data, but there's information there, down to building level, and he can produce things like this, overlay on a Google Earth image, whether or not a property is commercial or residential. And that sort of information at the building level would be really useful for impact modelling. Now, I've seen a couple of slides like this over the last day or so where it indicates gathering various spatial data sets, putting them in one place and providing the ability to produce information about exposure or vulnerability. Um, the, there's a lot of information about residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, uh, infrastructure, agriculture. Now, that's a big question for me. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that in a second. And environmental. So these are all the things that Russell has found that are available and uh, is um, pulling together in this system that he hopes will be available for anyone to go in and grab information from. These are the sorts of institutions that not only will benefit from impact forecasts, but in terms of planning uh, around and preparation, having information about where they are and what their vulnerability is really useful, obviously. Infrastructure information, we've talked a fair bit about that already. Agriculture. So he's got uh, exposure information about agriculture. Uh, we haven't got it yet in a useful way where we can assess what potential impacts on agriculture are for our national hazard outlook. So certain types of agriculture are vulnerable to certain types of hazards at different times of the year. We don't have enough of that exposure and vulnerability data to make confident forecasts of whether or not there's likely to be an agricultural impact. At the moment, we've made the decision not to include agricultural impacts in our national hazard outlook. And we have a process where people from our business solutions group who do have more information in regard to that come and speak to our forecasters theoretically on a daily basis. 
hasn't quite been happening like that. But. Okay, when you pull all this stuff together and you draw a geographical area, then you can pr produce a report that has all this sort of information. Uh, information about the buildings, uh, the population, demographics, are you older than 65 or are you under 16 years of age? Good information for vulnerability. Infrastructure, what sort of power is in the area? What sort of businesses, agriculture? Um, how many hospitals? All those sorts of things. So with the Nexus system, draw an area, produce a report about exposure, really useful. Uh, the sorts of things that Russell has been doing is been taking a tropical cyclone track, looking at where the greatest winds are likely to be out of a model or something, and then using that area to produce an exposure report ahead of the event and send this out to the emergency services to let them have a very good understanding of who's out there exposed and what the vulnerability is like. I won't go into this. For the technically minded, this is the architecture that Russell's building to produce a website to allow anyone to go and just grab exposure data on a daily basis. And uh, he's getting close too, so that's promising. So, the challenges. Data access. We've got to overcome the privacy issues and the commercial value issues. We need good negotiation skills, I think. Lots of smiling when you're talking to the people that you want stuff from and et cetera. Data gaps. Information, making sure we capture when the house was destroyed because of the tree, not because of the wind. We need it in really high spatial and temporal detail. We need the data to be reliable. We want to see the dots along the perfect line of agreement. The database incorporates appropriate information. So it allows us to build the vulnerability curves. That's a big one. And database platform uniformity. Hopefully, our data integration platform Australia project uh, manages to the very least do that. But uh, I would imagine that amongst this group would be extremely useful to have that conversation about as you build your impact data and databases, what are the platforms you're going to use so they're easily uh, interchangeable amongst your various organisations. So, nail time again. I'll leave it to Carolina to uh, run how long we do questions for. Thank <laughs> you.